And good morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. This is Harrison Smith back again with another episode of Cinema. I wanted to build a little off of uh, episode 101 where I was talking about Barry Diller and the cynical attitude of basically how Hollywood does a lot of hit and runs and they got theirs and now they're acting like, well, that's it, game over. I got mine, I'm going home. You guys all take care. Thanks for playing. And I mentioned in episode 101 a film specifically, Independence Day 2 or Independence Day Resurgence, uh, a film that came 20 some years after the original blockbuster hit. And uh, I guess I wanna make it clear here that cinema is, is not a film review series. Those of you who have been you know, listening to me for a while know that. I, I'm not reviewing movies. I'm, I'm taking movies that particularly stand out that fall under the classification of cinema. And although Jaws the Revenge is the big budget motion picture that inspired this entire podcast series, I will say that Independence Day 2 or Resurgence, whatever the hell you want to call it, uh, really is kind of like the Jaws the Revenge of mega blockbuster movies. And I'm going to explain why. So just bear with me here. I mean, there are plenty of film review sites online. And, and once in a while, a film comes along that defines everything about my cinema concept. And this one here, Roland Emmerich's, you know, two decades later, and why this is addressed later, sequel, Independence Day Resurgence, is hands down one of the worst films of the last 10 years, I'm going to say. And look, I knew what I was getting myself into when I went to watch this. I mean, it, it is one of those movies that you can easily dismiss by saying, well, what did you expect? I mean, it's okay. It's, it's not the worst thing ever. Just go with it. They, they got my money. However, as, as I talk about this, I, I continue to fight. I mean, I resist. I mean, I, I was told by somebody I'm at war with the world and I'm really not. I'm just begging people to use a little critical thinking and maybe we wouldn't have a lot of the shit that we do. And I guess I'm just not going to go into the darkness quietly. I had to get my, I guess, Bill Pullman, Henry V Braveheart speech moment because a number of people in this cynical mess all try for one. Have you, have you seen this movie? They're all trying to recreate that audience is going to stand up and cheer moment in this movie. There are like five of these things. Five. I think I counted, yeah, it's like at least four or five times when someone tried to give some kind of let's kick ass mini speech or pep talk in this shitty movie. And I keep telling myself, five writers, Independence Day 2 Resurgence had five writers. Heaven's Gate had one. Do you understand that? Michael Simino's Heaven's Gate is one of the longest movies ever. The one that is blamed for bringing down an entire movie studio. It is synonymous with box office failure and it had a single writer. I mean, Simino's much maligned and, and only recently rediscovered film may have, may have been long and indulgent or brilliant, but it wasn't cynical. At its worst, it was a narcissist engaging his passion with little regard for others. And the same cannot be applied to this miserable alien sequel that is a poster child for what is broken in the Hollywood system. And again, this is not a review, but let me get out what I think this quote unquote film is. It's long, it's no fun, it's overblown, a mess, a terrible script, and a CGI crap fest that manages to rip off every major sci-fi disaster film, including Michael Bay's shit. So why is it the topic of cinema? First of all, you've got Roland Emmerich. This is a guy who said he made a Godzilla movie, but didn't like them and had no real respect for them. He dismissed the creature and its film legacy as Lego building smashing. He then redesigned a worldwide icon and had zero regard for the audience that made the radioactive beast an icon since 1954. Add to it that he stripped the film of its anti-war and nuclear messages and gave Sony its wannabe Jurassic Park knockoff. I did an episode on this called Godzilla vs. Geno, or Godzilla vs. Cinema. Godzilla was a job, and without understanding the art that went into the original 1954 film. The 1998 film is cinema. Emmerich cobbled together a cynical patiche of, of other action films and Jurassic Park, and, and that's okay. Because Emmerich returns after two decades 
to deliver us a sequel to Independence Day that gives us a ripoff of his Godzilla ripoff while also ripping off the new Godzilla that tried to erase the stain of his ripoff. You follow me there? Resurgence is the Jaws the Revenge of science fiction films. They could have made a better movie and, all, and they had all the resources to do so. They simply chose not to. And that, my friends, is cinema. So it comes time to ask, is Roland Emmerich just an inept, big budget filmmaker? Or does he just have such contempt for actual movie cinema and audiences that he just doesn't care? Emmerich claims it took 20 years to make resurgence because he waited for technology to be developed to realize his vision. His ideas were just that big. And I ask, couldn't you have put some of that time to better use in developing a script instead of waiting for a green screen CGI moment? There isn't a single idea in a script that took five fucking people to write, including Emmerich himself. To be fair, Jurassic Park was 65 million years in the making. Maybe two decades isn't so bad. I equate the plus 100 million to make resurgence on the same level as making the 100 million replica of Noah's Ark that was recently making headlines a couple years ago. Sure, you can do it, but why? It is a total waste of money and resources that could have been spent elsewhere. This was a director's indulgence, and look what I can do filmmaking. I was no major fan of the first film. While it was a mess, it was an efficient mess. The first Independence Day was a summertime popcorn film that allowed brain checks at the door. It launched a few big screen careers, gave us an eclectic star packed cast, and allowed a script of one-liners and cheesy set pieces to walk us through to the ending that we all knew was coming. It wasn't a classic, but it worked. I am now a filmmaker. I wasn't when I saw the first film. Now my life depends on securing financing and making good films to live. I see things differently than I did in 1996 and what I saw 20 years later appalled me. They could have made a good film out of this, at least an entertaining one like the first one, but they didn't want to. First is casting. Like its script, and I use that in quotes, resurgence through everything and the kitchen sink into casting. The goal was to cover all bases, a multicultural ethnic cast that panders to the Chinese markets. This was done to ensure financial return akin to the stunt casting of the equally dismal Terminator Genesis. You can understand what I think about that in my one episode about reboots and repackagings and reimaginings. Will Smith didn't return, and with good reason. So the filmmakers ensured to compensate by bringing back every cast member of significance from the first film, while also kowtowing to the Chinese markets. The story I got is that Smith demanded 50 million and the studio balked. They should have paid it. I think he wanted that much money just to ensure that they wouldn't pay it. So he had an excuse so he could say, well, I'm not doing this because they didn't make my, my offer. Instead, we get lots of references to Smith his widow, and his son. But all it does is remind us how smart Smith was to avoid this turkey. Instead, they trot out Jeff Goldblum to do his nebbish Ian Malcolm boy wonder routine, and Gold Goldblum serves as the I knew this was going to happen element. He looks totally bored in this film. The alleged script gives nothing for him to do other than repeat his long-in-the-tooth bit from the first film for over two hours. For no other purpose than to connect this with the first film, Judd Hirsch returns as Goldblum's father. He has his own movie in this. They, they turned him into the comedy relief guy that Randy Quaid served in the first film. And poor Robert Loggia. This was one of his last appearances, and he gets 30 seconds of nonverbal screen time while Hirsch takes us on a bad Jewish stereotype bus ride to once again Area 51 to kvetch at his son David. Why the kids along the way that he picks up? I don't know. Well, I guess you need young kids to represent the crowd that didn't see the first film, right? And Bill Pullman returns as a disheveled, homeless-looking president who compliments Goldblum's I knew this with I told you so. We knew that beard is coming off eventually when he comes back to form, and we knew Pullman must die with an Armageddon rip-off ending 
that brings no tears and thankfully no treacly diabetes inducing Aerosmith songs. The original Star Trek timeline is undone. No chance of Data Prime in the Abrams Kelvin timeline leaves open Brett Spiner to be the other comic relief of this film. The writers ignore the fact that it was pretty clear he died in the first film. Now, if you want to argue against that, fine. However, the writers also ignore the fact that this guy was comatose and bedridden for 20 years and pops awake and starts walking all over the place like Charlie's grandfather in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, like Grandpa Joe, despite the horrible muscle atrophy that would have developed over that time. Spiner's cynical job is to connect us to the first film and add the mad scientist element to an already convoluted shitty screenplay. And the rest of the cast? Well, we make sure we have a main Chinese female action hero to pander to the Chinese markets and check off the female action hero interest. Let the Chinese develop the moon base and give the command of said base to the Chinese. Before the left wing easily offended readers get up in arms, this is not a racist statement, but it is a cynical one. This was a calculated move to hedge the bets. They knew they were making a lousy film, but if they could just eke out a decent opening weekend in China and other Asian markets, it just might work. Throw in a bunch of young, attractive, and boring 20-somethings to appeal to the middle and high school demographic that likely again didn't see the first film, and you complete the cynical recipe for Disaster Film 101 and My Cinema. Don't package all of these world cultures together and talk diversity. No, this has nothing to do with a reach out over color lines. The only color that mattered here was green. This was throw enough against the wall and see what sticks cynical filmmaking. In a way, this is kind of economic racism. Were the producers saying, get me a few Jews, a Chinaman, and several blacks, and make sure a few of them are women. In a sense, isn't that what they were really doing? Fox didn't screen the film in advance for the press, always a bad sign. I just want to know why it had to be this way. Dean Devlin invoked 9-11 as an impetus for the sequel. Really? Don't go connecting the CGI claptrap to a real landmark disaster that killed thousands. The New York attacks were in 2001. Why wasn't this out by then? Why didn't they release it back in, in the early 2000s? The first film was a monster hit. I know Emmerich and Devlin got sidetracked with their shitty Godzilla abortion. After that debacle, this should have been on the griddle to serve right up as a comeback. And then you've got the story. Aliens invaded. Aliens were defeated. Aliens come back. That's how simple this should have been. But when you are pandering to so many money targets, the actual story takes a back seat. We make sure we work in an African warlord and Will Smith's kid to secure a diverse cast. Look, just write a good story and people will come. Don't rip off every good and bad science fiction and action film of the last 20 years. The whole friendly alien thing, where the hell did that come from? The queen alien in this mess should have James Cameron shaking his head. But wait, let's make her 300 feet tall. Yeah, that's original and the audience will love it. Now we have some monster movie in there because, you know, We've got Kong Skull Island and Godzilla vs. Kong and Godzilla King of the Monsters. Let's cover that market while we're at it. Fit in every reference to the first film where we can legally squeeze in Will Smith without paying him. That will keep his presence attached and people talking. Let's throw in lots of action scenes and go big. I mean really big. Everything is bigger in this. Bigger ships, bigger aliens, bigger cast. Everything except bigger ideas. There isn't a fresh one to be found, and for a tenth of what the effects cost, they could have had a few in a real script. They had the resources to do this. They had the money. They had the ability to get good writing, and they had time. This is like Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skulls. We waited this long for this? So either the filmmakers are truly incompetent, or they set out to make a cynical piece of product that would hit all the proper marks to make money. You don't get to be Roland Emmerich by being incompetent. So I'm going with the latter, and I know someone who worked on the 3D version of this film who told me that Emmerich often just checked in in the morning with a cup of coffee and basically said, I don't give a shit, just get this thing finished. 
folks resurgence is cinema. It is one giant expensive shining example of accountants and market analysts making a movie. And the special effects, we waited two decades for this? Green screen action and set pieces, really? The ideas were just so fucking huge for resurgence that it took 20 years to realize them on screen? Where? I task the filmmakers now, show me where. What idea was just so broad in scope that it took all this time to get it up on the screen? You mean making a giant 300 foot queen alien? Didn't Stan Winston do this better and without cloying computer animation in 86's Aliens, another Fox film, 10 full years before the first film of Independence Day? I mean, granted she wasn't 300 feet, but the ideas, work, and artistry that went into constructing and animating the queen in James Cameron's film was far more breathtaking and still is than computer animation. Look, don't piss on my leg and tell me it's raining. Emmerich got caught up as a filmmaker and for whatever reason, Resurgence got dropped down the priority list. And don't get into the media and tell everyone that the ideas on screen were just so mind numbing in their expanse that the human race had to wait decades to implement them. There isn't a single thing in this film that took 20 years to make, not one. They dusted off the idea, trotted out the cast members still alive and willing to do it, and then went through the accounting and marketing analyst departments to build a film around a product, not a film. And you know what? When you do it like that, you get what you pay for. I sat in a mostly empty theater watching this. The ending was supposed to incite some type of applause with Brent Spiner gleefully announcing, we are taking the war to the aliens. This jingoism hit the wall and dropped with a resounding thud. The few people around me just got up and walked out. Not even a chuckle. I wonder if they were as disgusted as I was, or wondering, like me, why they just didn't walk out earlier. So there you go, folks. Independence Day Resurgence is just like Jaws the Revenge, and probably right on the same level as Jaws the Revenge. Totally had the budget and means to do something better, and the conscious decision was made to not do so. This is Harrison Smith. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to talking to you again really soon. Thank you.